want to talk a little bit about sustainability. Who's excited about sustainability and the agenda and the, uh, and the metrics that we're all working toward? <laughs> Who's really concerned about sustainability and all the things that we're being talked, uh, talked about doing and so on? That, that's been me too. And um, I think that uh, when I started putting this presentation together for a little talk in Ottawa back in May, I found that I learned a lot. And I'm sort of like, you know, I've been in this industry for 32 years, and there's some things here in my presentation that I should have known um, and, and frankly did not know, and really looking for the opportunities uh, in sustainable livestock production in Canada. The premise of the talk right from the beginning is that Canadian livestock agriculture is a force for food and a force for good. We hear a lot of negativity about uh, livestock agriculture around the world and certainly in Canada as well. And uh, we've heard this morning about the value of manure and uh, what if we didn't have livestock and didn't have manure, uh, we'd be buying a lot more synthetic fertilizer and from what Christine has shown, probably our soil health uh, and it wouldn't be so great as it is with manure application. There's certainly a growing tension in the world around um, this uh, feeding the world, necessity to feed the world. And I put in quotations purposely and saving the planet because I'm not sure all the things that were being talked about uh, out there are really going to, in fact, help, quote unquote, save the planet. What's being talked about at fairly high levels is that we've moved from an era of a problem of abundance of food, uh, certainly in developed nations, to uh, really a problem of uh, more of a scarcity of food um, in both development, uh, developed nations and certainly underdeveloped nations. We've all heard about the stats on the projected uh, global population. Uh, back uh, you know, in 2050, probably close to 10 billion people, and allegedly in 2100, about 11 billion people. Interesting that China had its second year of population decrease uh, in 2023. They're actually down 2 million people. Um, and so that's interesting, but India continues to grow, as you no doubt have read. I guess in uh, 2020, uh, we saw an increase in the number of people that uh, went hungry. Uh, partly driven by COVID, supply chain problems, these sorts of things. In any case, uh, there were about 800 million people that went hungry. This was about 9.9, uh, 10 percent of the world population, up from about 8.4 percent of the world population. Beyond uh, just being hungry, uh, FAO, and sometimes we read things from FAO, UN, these sorts of uh, organizations that concern us, um, but they admitted that about 1 billion people face inadequ inadequate protein intake. And that causes uh, lots of different nutritional deficiencies, like impaired growth, poor health, et cetera. And they even said, essential amino acids are key parameters in food quality assessment. So not just crude protein, but in fact, amino acids. And it is all about the metrics. And uh, often what we read in the news and so on is pretty simple science uh, and drives a bit of a, an agenda, I believe. Here's a great little study um, that was done back in 2021. Each bar, which you can barely see the bars, no doubt, from the back, but each bar on these graphs represents a country or a territory. So there's about 100, uh, just over 100 uh, countries or territories represented on each graph. Um, so often we talk about crude protein, um, and this is uh, the blue line. You won't be able to read that, but the average daily protein requirement for people is the blue line. And you can see on a crude protein basis, almost all the countries and territories have adequate or excess uh, ab above the average uh, requirement uh, for protein intake. What if you correct that for digestibility? Because not all protein is created equal. Uh, and in fact, uh, quite a few of those countries and territories start to fall below that um, average daily requirement uh, for digestible protein. And then once you look at amino acid profiling of that protein, in fact, uh, quite a few of the countries are coming up short. So very different picture than just on the crude uh, crude protein basis, right? Um, dive a little bit deeper, obviously lots of talk about getting our, our protein requirements from chickpeas and, and other pr uh, plant sources that we read about. Well again, is that protein as digestible as milk? No, obviously not. Milk is one of the most digestible proteins, obviously designed for infants uh, and young animals that uh, don't have a fully developed digestive system. Um, so the products that this room produces are some of the highest digestibility out of anything on our menu. And you can see how that digestibility slides down the scale as we move into more of the plant sources. I was quite encouraged by this uh, FAO reported in late 2023. This is table stakes for everyone in the room, but to hear it from FAO I think is quite encouraging. Terrestrial animal source food uh, provide high quality proteins, important fatty acids, 
and various vitamins and minerals, including iron, zinc, selenium, vitamin B12, choline, and calcium, among others, and that these are essential to human health. And so uh, they're actually starting to talk about the nutritional importance to humans of the meat, milk, and eggs that uh, uh, producers produce each and every day. Uh, they also quoted a 2016 article, beef and milk production require less, animal, uh, less land than be beans or peas when compared on an essential amino acid basis. Again, looking at the digestibility of that protein and the efficiency of uh, that protein provision vis-a-vis uh, -vis land use um, on milk production and beef production. Kind of unusual. We don't hear these things very often. It's always, you know, how terrible. In fact, here's a headline, avoiding meat, dairy, uh, and dairy is the single biggest way to reduce your impact on the earth. These are frustrating headlines. And again, uh, this is uh, data from actually our government, federal government, uh, which again uh, tends to, uh, uh, we think, have a little bit more of an agenda against livestock agriculture. Uh, but the two, uh, the blue and the green uh, bars on the left-hand side of the screen, green is 2005, uh, blue is 2019. Canada um, emits, uh, apparently, uh, about 1.5% of the GHG emissions in the world. I've got twins, son and daughter, that are in grade 11, and they're reading their textbook, and they say, Canada's the fifth largest emitter in the world. And I'm like, I don't think that's exactly correct. And by the way, it's a, like 2%. And so the headlines can really skew the information as we know. So um, the other thing is, uh, if you go to the right-hand side of the screen, you can see that agriculture is about 8% of that 1.5% for global emissions. Livestock agriculture is about 50% of the agricultural number, so 4% of 1.5% for global emissions. And yet, you see all the headlines and all the blame shifting. We know that this all started back in uh, 2016 with the Paris Agreement, with 195 states plus the EU uh, signing on to this Paris Agreement where they're looking to reduce uh, GHG emissions globally by 43% in 2030, or by 2030. And uh, of course, our federal government has a, a pathway uh, to that reduction that you can see on a sector basis. Green, uh, sorry, light blue being the um, uh, where are we here for agriculture? Yes, this color on the bottom. And you can see that they are looking for reductions even though we need more and more foodstuffs grown and produced in this country. The government decided that 2005 is the benchmark year and sadly, we didn't have all the data back then so we, you know, we're sort of not being able to get credit where credit's due in terms of improvements in this country on GHG emissions on agriculture or vis-a-vis um, -vis, you know, kilos of protein produced. And you can see what COVID did there uh, basically caused some uh, reductions uh, in 2020, 2021 on GHG emissions in Canada. What we don't see and hear about is the improvements that agriculture has already made uh, from that time frame. And so overall total emissions have increased, as has generally speaking productivity, um, but actually livestock animal production emissions have come down already by 18% which is a significant decrease over that time frame. Again, we don't usually hear about this. So we know that meat, milk, and eggs are key sources of digestible uh, amino acid-rich protein. Uh, it's definitely needed in the human diet. But then the argument is, okay, so that's great, but aren't they environmentally intense sources of a digestible protein? And we see these nasty headlines from Time, time Magazine as an example, cows are the new coal. Um, very, very frustrating. You've probably all read this before. I think we have to realize, too, there's lots of studies out there, and that climate crusaders and animal activists uh, uh, commission studies, too. There's one out of Vancouver I read some a uh, couple years ago, which just sort of drove me crazy, saying that if, uh, if people would uh, uh, go to a low, um, a low uh, meat, milk, and egg diet, that uh, we'd, you know, we'd beat our climate uh, targets just by doing so. Uh, I actually phoned them up in Vancouver. I said, you, you realize that, like, 70% of beef and 70% of pork in Canada is exported. If Canadian population stopped eating <laughs> beef and pork, we'd still have 70% leaving the country. I, I don't understand your study. She said, well, you didn't read the fine print. It's if all of North American population uh, reduced their use of our consumption of uh, you know, pork and, and, and beef that we would see that kind of improvement. I said, well, that was very fine print, because you're right. I couldn't find it in the study. Um, 
Likely some attempts to blame shift from the energy sector as well. Um, so let's look past the headlines. We believe it's time to try to change the narrative. And back in October 2022, there was a meeting in Dublin, Ireland um, called the, uh, the Meat Summit, uh, the, role, the Science and the Role of, uh, of Meat Summit. And they came and launched this uh, Dublin Declaration. I don't know if you've seen or heard of this. Uh, go on, go on, the, on the online, go on the web and look it up. It's actually um, uh, quite a great declaration. It's a one pager, we won't go through it all today. But livestock systems must progress on the basis of the highest scientific standards. They are too precious to society to become the victim of simplification, reductionism, or zealotry. So the declaration aims to give voice to the many scientists around the world who research diligently, honestly, and successfully in various disciplines in order to achieve a balanced uh, view of the future of animal agriculture. At the bottom of the declaration, they quoted a United Nations Food Summit from 2021 that says, human civilization has been built on livestock from initiating the Bronze Age more than 5,000 years ago, being the bedrock of food security uh, for modern societies today. Livestock is a millennia-long proven method to create healthy nutrition and secure livelihoods, a wisdom deeply embedded in cultural values everywhere. Sustainable livestock will also provide the solutions for additional challenge of today uh, to stay within the safe operating zone of the planet Earth's boundaries, the only Earth we have. So there again, that came from the UN. And often what we hear from the UN, FAO, and, and WEF is not very positive around livestock agriculture. Again, heartening, and of course, this is why Dublin Declaration actually included that. Since that launch of that declaration, there's almost 1,200 scientists that have signed on around the world to the declaration, which is encouraging. Okay, back to digestibility and looking at it on a GHG basis, emission basis. So typically, this is the kind of uh, ch chart that we see, right? Crude protein, um, wheat, rice, corn, or maize, um, you know, what's the GHG emissions per ton of crude protein produced? Well, of course, the plant proteins seem to be very efficient in that manner. Eggs, pork, and milk, not so much. But what if we actually um, correct for digestibility on a lysine basis? It changes the graph substantively, and suddenly eggs and pork are actually um, more efficient on a GHG basis than uh, the plant proteins there, and milk, uh, the delta is much, much tighter, as you can see. All right, what about minerals and vitamins? We know that you know, meat, milk, and eggs are rich in minerals and vitamins, and this is looking at a GHG footprint um, of eating enough food to acquire one-third of a typical adult's needs on vitamins and minerals like iron, zinc, calcium, folate, vitamins uh, A and B12. And suddenly you can see how great, and not surprising actually, that meat, milk, and eggs look as compared to uh, grains, whole grains, refined grains, etc. So we're doing a great job. All right, so then what's the other argument? Well, okay, great, but animals are eating my food or the, this one point uh, or this billion, you know, uh, 10 billion people population kind of uh, foodstuffs, and they're not very efficient converters. We hear that a lot on the ruminant side, right? Well, 86% of uh, what global livestock feed is inedible by humans. We got all ruminant producers in here. We know we don't eat forages, we don't eat hay, we don't eat corn stalks. Um, and so uh, this is the argument that, you know, doesn't get talked about a whole lot, is actually cattle are up, uh, upcycling uh, inedible raw materials into high-quality protein and nutrient-rich foods. And actually, animals are eating a lot of the food waste, human food waste and biofuel waste in certainly North America. In fact, 40 million metric tons a year of byproducts are consumed by dairy cattle uh, in North America. 40 million metric tons. And yes, we talk about, you know, the burping and the farting uh, of cows. And so if you look at, uh, you know, the emissions on a cow on this byproduct, yes, there's some emissions there, 70 grams um, per kilogram of byproduct. But what if we instead, we had no cows, and we just landfilled or composted instead? Well, in fact, if we composted, there's five times more emissions, and if we just landfilled, it's 50 times more emissions on those byproducts. And we get the, uh, the beef or the milk out of the cows when we actually feed uh, those byproducts. Okay, oh, I always wanted to not show this first before I ask the question. What's the most efficient uh, livestock species on feed conversion? Come on, speak up, guess. I know what I would guess before I saw the data. Chicken. Chicken. 
Okay, I'll say terrestrial. I don't know much about fish, to be honest with you. Um, but yeah, everyone says chicken, right? Uh, interestingly enough, um, dairy cows actually, on a pounds of feed per pound of product, i.e., in this case, fresh milk, um, are actually more efficient than chicken at 1.1 versus 1.6. Beef is always the bad one, right? It's like, oh my goodness, it's 14. 14 pounds per pound of, uh, in this case, beef. Well, what, yeah, what if we take away the inedible product for humans? Um, like that 86%, boom, all of a sudden, it's 1.6 just like a chicken. Chickens eat corn and soy around the world. It's, 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 uh, whether it's grown locally or shipped, um, which obviously humans can consume and as a decent source of protein. Um, and then, uh, so yeah, the net contribution uh, on, and you look at what happens uh, on the dairy cow, oh my goodness, 0 0.27. Very, very efficient on a human edible food basis. I think the other sort of proposition out there is that, that you know, to feed all these people, and then we got inefficient cows, we need more and more cows. Well, actually there's only been a 0.8% increase in cattle numbers globally uh, over from 2012 to 22. Um, hangs around about a billion uh, cattle. Also look at the incredible improvements. Uh, 2011, not that long ago, 26.6 liters per cow per day on average. Uh, today more like almost 36 uh, liters per cow per day. Canadian ag is doing a great job. And we know uh, just from these numbers, right, you see the milk production in Canada just continue to climb when cattle numbers continue to plateau or even decrease, beef and, and, and dairy. Sow numbers, same thing, plateaued a long time ago. Chicken, I always sort of joke, you know, death, taxes, and people eating more chicken are the three guarantees in life. And you can see that uh, outside of COVID, it's uh, a pretty uh, significant increase year by year. So developed nations, food production reduction. The challenge we have is, in the face of a growing population, a hungry population, a, a richer population globally that wants to um, have more meat, milk, and eggs. Um, we've had COVID shutdown related supply chain impacts, geopolitical unrest just seems to continue to grow, whether it's Ukraine, Russia, Middle East, um, lots of challenges out there, civil unrest, multilateral agreement breakdowns um, through politics and different things, uh, which certainly impacts uh, Canada exports, foreign animal diseases that continue to proliferate, uh, food for green energy production, obviously all the ethanol production as an example, has an impact. Uh, expensive feedstuffs, certainly the last uh, year or two, uh, resulting in tight margins or negative margins for sure in some circumstances for livestock production, people are getting out. We know from an RBC study uh, that was released re uh, recently that um, in the next 10 years, 40% of farmers are retiring. And um, it's great to see uh, young families and, and young parents in this room and people just coming to the university because uh, the dairy industry has been one in this country that has uh, actually got uh, quite a bit of investment and the next generation is coming in. Not always the case in some of the species uh, in Canada. And then developed nations reductionist agenda for achievement of national GHG emission targets. And we've seen what's been going on in the Netherlands. Uh, uh, and NL government trying to buy and close down 3,000 farms. I did, I did a little looking. There's 30,000 farms in the Netherlands, so this is 10% of the farms. Uh, we work with shippers uh, through Farmers Depot and talking to Mark Shippers there. They bought a dairy farm in the Netherlands um, about three or four years ago um, as a showcase facility for their high care concepts for dairy. He told me uh, not that long ago, the Dutch government kind of called him up and said, hey, we'll buy that farm back from you. And um, he said, Ian, I could have made a million euro and it would have just been shut down. Now he didn't sell it, but uh, that's the kind of thing that's going on. And we see the, you know, the tractor protests most recently in Germany with the fuel subsidies coming off. And um, it's crazy, you know, back in 2004, Netherlands uh, worked together with universities, private companies, government support, international partnerships, and they made this Food Valley commitment and created a brand and lo and behold, this tiny country with very little land became the uh, second largest exporter of agri-food products globally. They put their minds to it, they committed to it, they worked together, and they became the, some of the most efficient producers uh, in the world. And now they're closing it down. And, you know, not just Netherlands, but all this uh, sort of reductionism is causing, obviously, uh, world food prices to rise. 
and obviously the poorest countries are suffering the most. This slide is a little bit older, but uh, voluntary commitments on sustainability are gaining ground, especially in Europe, right? And you can see the brands, and some of these are, are North American brands, uh, and the kind of uh, commitments they've made to reductions on emissions, on the deadlines. And this is, you know, this is from Rabobank, but voluntary commitments. But what we're seeing even in Canada now is mandatory ESG reporting for Canadian publicly traded companies. And I think sometimes we look at these companies and go like, guys, why are you pushing this agenda so hard? Well, it's government and it's financiers like the banks that are requiring this. And now the Canadian Securities Administration are working to establish these requirements for publicly traded companies. And so um, they're, all, they're all dealing with it. Um, and of course, the uh, marketing boards and associations are trying to keep up and, and make sure that they remain relevant uh, to the marketplace and to the regulations. Ted Billier, um, many people wouldn't necessarily know him. He was the president of Maple Leaf Foods International for some years. He worked with CAPI, Canadian Agricultural Policy Institute. Very learned and a well-networked gentleman. I have a lot of respect for him. Last year at this time, there was a Canadian Agri-Food uh, in a Hungry World Summit. And he said this, we need to ensure we do no harm unto production while we're doing good on the climate scene. The reason I say that is because whatever we don't produce here in this country, uh, as an example, is going to be produced somewhere else that's a lot more carbon intensive and a lot worse for everyone. And this is the, the, the side of the argument I don't think people understand in developed nations. If, if more and more livestock production moves to lesser developed nations, uh, animal welfare will, will go down. We all have the regulations, we have pro-action, we have all these things that we, uh, codes of practice that you know, developed nations like North America and Canada all have to adhere to uh, and, and are certainly working toward that end. If it goes over, you know, different underdeveloped nations, animal welfare actually gets worse. And certainly CO2 emissions go up because we're so efficient. And the reality is that Canada is already one of the most efficient producers of meat, milk, and eggs in the world. And shame on me, I didn't know this uh, until I started looking at it. So pork, um, Canadian pork, uh, uh, C, uh, CPC did a study, um, and basically uh, we're in the top uh, two in the world. Uh, Russian Federation apparently um, somewhat more efficient on a GHG basis. What about beef? Um, in fact, we're in the top six or seven in the world and way, way uh, more efficient from a GHG basis than China, Brazil, USA, and India. Um, what about chicken? Best in the world, actually. What about milk? This is North America, best in the world. And Canada's um, basically uh, more efficient than the USA as well. And you can see, uh, this is from obviously dairy farmers, but 7% um, lower uh, carbon footprint, 6% less um, water consumption, 11% less land use uh, for each uh, liter of milk produced. Uh, and that's over uh, from 2011 to um, 2016. What about eggs? Well, we know what's happened with the, the and right, it used to have like 150 eggs a year, now it's 340 on average. Um, Canadian egg production, best in the world on a GHG basis. So it's really interesting to me that actually our supply managed, we're top of the heap, best in the world. In our non-supply managed, we're in the top probably five in the world. So this argument that people hear out there and say out there is that you know, supply management keeps inefficient producers in, in, in business, seemingly not so. So we're trying to help spread the word as a company. Uh, so our new trucks, uh, which you uh, will hopefully see on the road um, here and there, but Canadian chicken, already the most sustainable in the world and still improving. Uh, Canadian beef, already one of the most sustainable in the world and still improving. Canadian pork, uh, same uh, statement. Our next truck is gonna be this one, the dairy one, uh, already in the most sustainable world and still improving. Because we gotta help get this, this word out there. And we still can improve with uh, deploying science and technology. So you've heard about uh, 3 nop or uh, DSM's Bovier, not registered for use in Canada. On dairy, um, they're saying that 30% uh, reduction in methane redu uh, emissions. On beef, 45%. Unfortunately, I haven't seen a lot of data on this yet. What I'm hearing, though, is there's numerous additives coming out that will reduce methane uh, emissions, but they don't necessarily help with feed efficiency. And so it's gonna rely on carbon credits to pay for this thing uh, because you're not necessarily gonna see better productivity in your herds uh, through some of these additives. However, Agilent, 
uh, which is registered for use in Canada. Um, you can see this sort of global meta-analysis of 23 trial results, 3,500 cows. Uh, you can see increased fat, protein, corrected milk, uh, improved feed efficiency, decreased methane, and fertility improved as well. And we're actually running some trials on Eglin here in Ontario and in British Columbia right now. And uh, this is just some preliminary results uh, from our Ontario study, uh, looking like some uh, nice improvement on standard milk production and dairy fat uh, yield as well. We need this. We need this uh, further improvement in efficiency, obviously, to uh, pay for the investment in the Eglin. Um, but uh, Eglin has also just announced that you can get carbon credits by feeding Eglin. So it's the first ever carbon credit payments in Canadian dairy farmers for reducing enteric methane. Um, a carbon credit, uh, pretty complicated, uh, but we'll keep it simple here, is basically one ton of CO2 equivalent that's not released in the atmosphere because you're doing something different, in this case feeding something different. And a cow generates roughly uh, 0.4 uh, tons of carbon, uh, sorry, of CO2 equivalent per year, and thereby um, there'd be a potential of uh, 0.4 credits per year per, per cow. So what's been established so far um, is that, in fact, uh, you could be looking at $11 uh, per cow per year if you fed Eglin the whole year. And so the um, nice thing is if you have, in fact, fed Eglin for some time frame, you can retroactively go back uh, to November 2022. You need to sign up by February 1st of this year, and then payments would be expected in the summer um, uh, for that roughly $11 per cow per year on the Eglin. So it's the start. Um, we figure it's about 50% of the cost of the Eglin, so as long as you're getting a uh, feed efficiency benefit, um, there would be an ROI on using that. And that's a big thing, right, is the feed efficiency. We know that it's about 70% of our cost of production, uh, whether it's meat, milk, or eggs. It's also about 70 or 80% of our GHG emissions when you uh, start calculating a life cycle analysis. North America, uh, already um, most the, the most feed efficient uh, in pr uh, production of beef and dairy in the world. Um, and we know that when we're doing life cycle assessments, and we've done some of these uh, as a company for uh, sort of pilot studies on meat, milk, and eggs. And we know, I mean, not surprisingly, the more efficient the farm, the more profitable the farm, also the more sustainable the farm. So if you don't even sort of really embrace the sustainability thing, um, just keep doing what you're doing, improving your efficiencies, uh, getting credit for it, um, obviously, is the key thing in knowing your metrics. Uh, the more profitable you are, most likely, uh, the more uh, sustainable you will be the more opportunity you may have for carbon credits in the future. So as a company, um, we're really looking at uh, continuing on doing what we've always been doing, really enabling sustainable livestock farming how? With data-driven insights, uh, innovative business intelligence solutions that optimize feed and production efficiency, uh, profitability and resource stewardship, and continue to uh, foster ever-improving meat, milk, and egg production in this country. You know, animal numbers are now increasing. We're not looking to feed uh, less animals more as a company. We want to feed more animals with less and make our producers more efficient, more profitable, more sustainable. Okay, now I got to watch my time. Um, I'm a little bit uh, behind, but just really quickly. Then there's the whole sequestration story. Um, giving credit where credit due. What other sector owns and, uh, and manages millions of acres and billions of trees? No one. In this country, we've got 2.5 billion acres, about 900 million acres of forest, about 154 million acres of uh, arable land that's uh, under, under management. There are 190,000 farms, and you can quickly see how the, uh, the land use uh, breaks down across those 190,000 farms and 150 million acres. Again, heartening, expert panel on Canada's carbon sink potential, uh, de December 2022. Crop land management and avoided grassland conversion hold the greatest potential for carbon sequestration in agriculture and grasslands. The government knows that our grasslands and crop, uh, crop land has huge carbon sequestration uh, potential. It's not easily measured yet, um, but again, I think it's a huge opportunity. And, uh, and as a company, we recognize, as a free mix company fundamentally, all of our customers are land-based. We want to help. Uh, producers, again, uh, achieve credits where credit's due. So we're working on understanding a little bit more on the measurement, reporting, and verification systems that are being developed 
on sequestration. It's complicated, um, but I do think that um, producers have a great opportunity here in the future. So here's just an example um, of a farm, 80 uh, tons of carbon produced by uh, 80 mother car uh, sorry, six, 50 mother cows and 80 young calves. Obviously some emissions through tractors and equipment, but on this 550 acre pasture, if we could uh, sequester 500 tons of carbon and actually measure and verify that, then this farm would be uh, net, uh, net negative in terms of um, the, the, uh, the carbon it emits versus the carbon it uh, sequesters. And that's where, again, I think we can be proud participants in the largest carbon sequestration industry in the world. There's no other industry that does that. And so this is why we say Can Canadian agriculture is really ground zero for net zero. And uh, as the uh, measurement systems and verification systems come more into play, um, I think there's a great opportunity actually here. Canada, we have a small population. We're quite blessed, right? We have uh, the ability to produce way beyond our needs. We have a huge arable land mass. We have an abundant fresh water, unlike many countries in the world. We have millions of hectares of forest and arable land uh, that can be better managed and, and, and measured for sequestration. We're creators of technology and adopters of it. We have massive opportunity to be the breadbasket and the protein charcuterie for the world by growing a robust and rural urban economy. And I think we have a moral, even biblical obligation to feed the poor and the hungry in the most sustainable and cost-efficient manner available globally. A quote from a gentleman rabbi, Jonathan Sachs, a nation becomes strong when it cares for the weak. It becomes rich when it cares for the poor. It becomes invulnerable when it cares for the vulnerable. And we have that through our, the blessings that we just mentioned on that list. We have that capability. Again, back to Ted Billier. As Canadians, we often set out to do good or look good. Uh, sometimes I think our prime minister is constantly trying to look good. Um, but sometimes that gets in the way of doing the right thing. So what do we believe the right thing to do is? Continue to become the most profitable, uh, sorry, most sustainable meat, milk, and egg producers, oilseed producers, grain producers in the world. We're already pretty much there. And we just need to continue to improve uh, uh, in that way. Maximize our production of uh, digestible protein and be able to feed the world, help feed the world. Enact government policies that encourage and finance uh, much greater productivity and production uh, in an increasingly GHG efficient manner. Our government needs to invest in infrastructure. Our ports, our rail systems, our roads uh, are not adequate to our potential for exports. Um, we need to encourage agri-food capacity expansion, facility modernization, technology development and adoption, and ease of, uh, uh, through ease of capital. I should say too, I was in a meeting with um, Maple Leaf Foods back in April and they were doing a case study on their sustainability initiatives. And what I was really actually interesting that they would say this in public, I thought, um, they said two things that really intrigued me. They're buying carbon credits to offset, right? And they said, we would much prefer to buy carbon credits from our own supply chain. I'm like, wow. You know, my dad always talked about getting a higher percentage of retail dollar back into producers' hands. I thought, maybe this is a way we can do that. Actually, Maple Leaf Foods is writing checks to producers uh, for carbon credits. Wouldn't that be kind of neat? The other thing they said, which was both intriguing and, and a bit worrying, uh, is they said, you know, our, our banker gave us better lending rates because of our, site, our, our um, ESG and sustainability commitments. I thought, okay, that's interesting too. Can, can we as a company help our producers uh, through uh, you know, sustainability initiatives and, and projects? Can we actually help you get better lending rates? Sadly, I'm a little bit concerned, right? Because I think some of these publicly traded companies, access to markets and access to capital is going to be, um, you're going to have to uh, do these things. And I hope we don't get there uh, at the farm level. And again, as a closing, uh, number six, develop uh, agreed upon sequestration metrics uh, to encourage uh, maximizing management practices on the, on the farms and really allow credit to be given where credit is due. So this is why we say Canadian agriculture, Canadian livestock agriculture is a force for food and a force for good. And we're trying to uh, help uh, change the narrative. And I trust all of us are doing that. And uh, arm ourselves with a little bit of the science that I'm trying to show here today that we are doing a great job uh, we can further improve and help feed the world. So thank you for your, uh, your attention this morning.